Thank you. Thank you, President Woodward, and congratulations to the class and to the families of the class of 2019. <clears throat> I graduated from the University of Hartford's Hart School in 2001. I think I know where they're sitting. I remember sitting through this ceremony then, as you are all sitting now, relishing in that feeling of accomplishment, but also constantly having to make room for a growing sense of anxiety about what came next. Until now, you have all lived your own very separate lives, connected to each other only by the short window of time you've spent on this campus. Each of you have a different idea about what the future holds once you step into tomorrow. And while you spend lots of time focused on all the things that make you stand out, that make you unique, I also want to remind you that what you're feeling in your gut right now, that energy, that anticipation, those are the same things your friends are feeling right next to you. That tingle up the back of your neck when your name is called today, yeah, you're not the only one who feels that. That mixed bag of sadness you feel when you look out at all these buildings stacked full of your life memories. The reckoning of how quickly the last four years went by. Rest assured, the person sitting four seats down from you, yeah, she's feeling that too. I learned so much about myself during my college years here. But there's one thing that I learned later. Something I had to learn on my own, and I want to talk about it with you. It's not career advice or some type of shortcut. No, what I want to tell you is that much of what we believe are our own private experiences are actually shared by the people around us. Shared not only by the people we love, but by the people we interact with daily. I'll explain what I mean, but note what I just said. Many of the experiences we believe to be private are actually shared by the people around us. As I've grown into my adulthood, I learned that the more I lean into this feeling, and embrace it, the smaller and less lonely the world feels. So today is all about you, and you deserve it. You look fabulous. Robes are coming back in a big way. Mine can double as a parachute. Really though, you have so much to be proud of. You've worked really hard to get through your studies, to invest in your friendships, and to learn to be a half-functioning adult away from home. You've supported your school at Hawks games and student-organized concerts, maybe even a few plays, maybe. Yeah, today is all about you, which is why today is also the perfect time to think about others. It can be nice once in a while, and certainly in moments like these, to take a deep breath and remind yourself that you are not floating through this world alone. We are all in it together, experiencing it together, I'm only a bit older than you are, and I have to say, the 22-year-old me would be pretty excited to see where it's all ended up. I live on a beautiful tree-lined block in New York City. I produce Broadway shows and tours for a living. I'm married to an extraordinary person, and I have two equally extraordinary children. Hi, Shiri. Hi, Nomi. Hi, Ruben. But my daily truth isn't that. I worry about money all the time. I struggle to exercise enough and eat healthy. I'm exhausted by the political discourse in our country. I feel guilty about how much time I spend looking at my phone. And deep down, I worry that someday the whole world will realize I'm faking it. That's right. Even after 20 years of hard work and some real success, my innermost worries and fears are all the same. And my fears are a lot like yours. And yours are a lot like the person sitting four seats down from you. Our common humanity comes with the same set of a dozen or so core emotions that play out and rearrange themselves day after day in familiar, repeating patterns. And that is the spirit of what I want you to think about today, how alike we are. And in considering that, we can touch on what I believe is the most important thing in the world, empathy. Empathy, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Let me step back a moment. The Wolf family had a pretty big year in 2018, as you've just heard. My wife and I saw the small foreign film about eight years ago called The Band's Visit. 
It's the story of an Egyptian band that comes to perform a concert in Israel. And through a misunderstanding at the border, they end up in the wrong town. With no bus until the morning, the small band is taken in by the local Israelis. I optioned the film, and with the help of an incredible team, including Hart graduate Max Williams, I worked for seven years to adapt it into a Broadway musical. Last season we opened, we got rave reviews, eventually winning 10 Tony Awards, the third most awarded show in the history of Broadway, only topped by the producers and Hamilton. Let's face it, that show and its success is why I'm here talking to you today. The funny thing is, my show is so very different from either the producers or Hamilton. It's a simple and quiet tale, like the sleepy Israeli town that the band gets lost in. There are no big dance numbers or songs with actors belting to the rafters. There are no special effects or movie stars to draw people in. So why did critics and audiences embrace it? I believe it is because the heart of the band's visit is entirely about empathy. And the actions that unfold on stage are informed by that. Fortunately for my show, the world today is hungry for empathy, for a sense of shared experience. On many levels, successful art is all about empathy. It grants us the superpower of being able to feel what another person is feeling. And it's what has always drawn me to the theater, that theater can teach us about how to live in and experience this world in a more empathetic way. So let me channel my inner theater nerd for just a minute and give you a few examples to illustrate what I mean. Empathy and the suspension of disbelief. I have been an avowed theater dork for years before coming to Hart. But it wasn't until I studied here that I was able to truly grasp and articulate what it was about being in a theater that lit me up. It was the way it created a shared experience, sitting in a dark room with fully grown adults playing make-believe to a willing and paying audience. That, to me, is a real demonstration of the power of empathy. How does an actor or play a character that is different from who they are in real life? How can an audience member be brought to tears or be made to laugh knowing full well she is only experiencing something that is make-believe? Our suspension of disbelief in the theater is the actual manifestation of our need to empathize. What a concept. We are so hungry to empathize that in an effort to feel connected, we trick our brains into seeing and experiencing things that aren't real. Early on while developing the band's visit, I came across a very short fable inspired by, uh, by a passage from the Arabian Nights. And I believe it speaks to the value of the suspension of disbelief. It begins. They tell a tale of a Bedouin who lost his way in the desert. His camel died and his water bag dried up. And just as he wished for death, an oasis rose before him. With a bubbling stream shaded by an old palm tree, the Bedouin made his way to the oasis. He drank from its water, silenced his hunger with the dates, and fell asleep in the shade of the palm leaves. The next day, he filled his water bag and replenished his supplies to set out on his journey once more. After a few moments of walking back into the endless sun, he became doubtful again. When he looked back, the oasis was gone with no trace. Once the Bedouin traveler realized that the oasis was gone, he understood that it had all been a figment, a dream. But when he opened his bag to drink, the bag was filled with sweet water. As the cold water touched his lips, he wondered if the oasis had been real. In the end, thought the Bedouin, his thirst now satisfied and with a newfound determination to carry on, in the end, it is not that important. So in the end, it didn't matter if the oasis was real or not, so long as the Bedouin canteens was full, and likewise in the theater. It doesn't matter if the band's visit's story of lost Egyptians spending a night in the Negev actually happened. If a single audience member is moved by the experience to feel something, if one person now has the ability to imagine a Middle East that isn't seen through the lens of a 24-hour news cycle, then something real has been altered in that person's life. Their canteen is perhaps more filled than it was before the show. Empathy while sitting in a room full of strangers, just like today. There is something else unique to live theater that engenders empathy, something that's distinguishable from film and television. It's the power of seeing something live, 
and sharing that experience with a room full of strangers. Theater is an experience that requires you to be in a room. And funny enough, this central premise reminds me of a story that took place while I was a student here. It's actually the story of why I became a theater producer. It was the end of my junior year and I was starring in a new play, a courtroom drama that ran two and a half hours, easy, and featured me on stage the entire time. Not an exciting proposition for anyone. Anyhow, it was the day of our first public performance, which meant that the whole theater was gonna be packed with family and friends. It was also an excruciatingly hot early summer day in Hartford that was made worse when I arrived to the theater and was told the air conditioning had broken down. This was not good. The idea of performing my show for two and a half hours while my friends and family sweated and anxiously awaited the play's end felt like no reality I was willing to accept. So in a panic, I drove out to a few friends' apartments and borrowed their floor fans. I came back to the theater and started plugging the fans up and down the aisle of the theater. The director came in. Orin, he yelled. We're an hour to curtain and the entire cast is downstairs getting into costume and warming up. What the blank are you doing here? I explained that I couldn't focus on the show if I had to watch people sweating in the audience all night. Orin, he yelled again. The heat isn't your problem. You're an actor. If you care so much about the temperature in the theater, go be a producer. <laughs> Ding. I smiled for, for two reasons, really. One, because for the first time in my life and in that exact moment, the idea of being a producer clicked in. I could create the experience of watching a show, the whole experience, without having to focus only on performing. And two, by that point, all the fans were already plugged in and it really helped. Funny though, you know, my concern for the audience's experience that day is directly tied to what I love most about the theater. For two hours, we're all forced to be in a room together, sharing our space and experiencing something as a group. Experience a, uh, experiencing a room that is too hot or too cold. Experiencing it when an actor is having a particularly good or bad performance. Or experiencing a moment when the stage hits the audience so hard that the entire room lets out a collective sigh. That is the magic of theater. And that is the magic of this moment right now. And I believe our ability to share these moments with strangers enhances our ability to empathize. My final example is how empathy is informed by our ability to communicate. Of course, theater relies entirely on this ability. And at the risk of sounding a little older than, my, uh, than, than you, I will say that the world I graduated into in 2001 communicated very differently than the world you are facing today. I got my first cell phone, a Motorola flip phone, my sophomore year at heart. By the time I graduated, I had upgraded to a Palm Pilot. Look it up. <laughs> the first time I was introduced to my wife, it was through Friendster. It was like Facebook, except without the like button, the fake news, or the plans for world domination. <laughs> Throughout my postgraduate adulthood, I've witnessed and lived through the internet explosion that has shaped our lives. It's awesome and frightening. And it really is now, in reflection, something that I can truly appreciate. It seems obvious now, but how we use the internet in every facet of our lives is a relatively new thing. It's how I wake up, it's how I listen to music, it's how I read my news, how I take and look at photos, how I watch shows, it's how I communicate. I used to own an alarm clock, listen to CDs, hold a newspaper, develop photos at the drugstore. And most importantly, I used to only be able to pick up my phone to talk to people. The internet on our phones, text messaging, Facebook, Twitter, these new means of communicating are chock full of innovations that are exciting and certainly break down barriers that previously existed. But with this new tech, there is also a very real downside. By shortening our sentences and simplifying our vocabulary, we are chipping away at the richness and power of our language, thereby diluting our ability to communicate effectively. Take the news, for example. Most of the news we consume these days is malnourished, since advertisers know the headline is all you need to drive traffic. As our interest in reading long-form articles is diminished, so is our ability to understand context. The sheer force of going online for information becomes intoxicating and poisonous. 
When I graduated and moved to Brooklyn in 2001, I watched from my roof as the second plane crashed into the World Trade Center. On that day and in the weeks to follow, I wasn't able to go into my room and open my phone to absorb the news and understand the world's reaction. I needed to sit with my friends in the living room, watching the TV or talking to people at the bar to process what it all meant. I'm saying this because our respect for the meaning of words and our need to use an expansive vocabulary to communicate how we feel is what allows us to un be understood, and it is what enables us to empathize. It informs how we treat each other, how we honor and protect the people around us, and how we share each other's burdens and celebrate each other's successes. Otherwise, days like today would be unnecessary. Standing next to your peers and celebrating your collective accomplishments is a shared experience. And in many ways, it's these experiences that make us human. Clearly, theater has been my lens into the idea of empathy. What will be yours? Whatever path you choose, I assure you there will be opportunities to answer that question each and every day. Seek them out and see where they take you. In the end, empathy, like acting, like basketball, like practicing medicine or law, is a skill. It takes practice and daily commitment, and it's never too early to start. So yes, today is about you, but can you make room, even today, for a shared experience? Can you make room for your friend's sadness because of a missing family member, for your parents' emotional pride tinged with their wistful recognition of time passing? For your sister's adolescent discomfort with dressing up and having to play the perfect kid for the day? Can you find someone you don't know very well and ask them how they're doing? This act, more than anything else you accomplish when you leave here today, will end up being the true mark of who you are. And now I look to you, and I empathize with your desire to move on with your day. <laughs> totally understood. Enough speechifying for me, so go on, be remarkable. Be courageous, be yourself, and go and make the world a better and a more empathetic place. Thank you.